Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and once again, welcome to this morning's webinar, The Future of Digital Surgery. It's a web series hosted by the Digital, Digital Surgery Division at Medtronic. Uh, before we get started this morning, we do have a few housekeeping rules that we need to go over with each and every one of you. Uh, the first thing that we need to let you know is that this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to all participants. Uh, the system is not intended to direct surgery or aid in diagnosis or treatment of a disease or condition. Uh, finally, the opinions expressed by our guest speakers today are theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect those of Medtronic. Now, once again, let's get started. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has joined uh, us live for this third and final edition of our three-part discussion about digital surgery at Medtronic and our focus on delivering digital solutions today and tomorrow that support surgeons and their teams. Uh, I'm George Murgatroyd. I'm the Interim General Manager of Digital Surgery, which is a team within surgical robotics, uh, part of Medtronic. And it's a pleasure to be here today to moderate this um, session. As a leader in medical technology, Medtronic is at the forefront of in innovations that are shaping the future of healthcare and artificial intelligence is an integral part of that. We're using data analytics to try to reduce barriers to care, improve access to the quality of care and work with partners around the world to improve the way surgery is performed. So today, over the next hour, we're gonna explore digital technologies from analytics, software to AI and discuss how healthcare systems can harness these technologies to create new and exciting possibilities for the future of the operating room. And it promises, I think, to be an exciting hour. We are live. I think in our first webinar, we had a power cut uh, that, that got in the way halfway through. I think one of our panelists has narrowly avoided a hurricane on the East Coast. So hopefully we will get through the, the next hour without any natural disasters. Um, and uh, with that said, let's go and meet our brilliant panel. Um, if we go to the previous slide, there we go. Um, uh, and we're delighted, uh, honoured and, and very excited to be joined today by three brilliant guests, a pioneering surgeon and technologist, Dr. Santiago Horgan, Professor and Chief of Surgery at UC San Diego Health, a senior and influential industry leader, Megan Rosengarten, the President of the Surgical Robotics Unit at Medtronic, and a leading scientist and widely published academic, Professor Dan Stoyanov, Chief Scientist with Digital Surgery. So I'm going to go to Professor Horgan, then to Megan, and then uh, over to Professor Dan Stoynov to briefly introduce themselves. Um, so over to yourself, um, Dr. Horgan, for a, a quick introduction. Hello, George. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today. As, as you mentioned, I am Chief of MIS at UCD and the Director for the Center for the Future of Surgery, probably one of the biggest training facilities in the country. Um, we have been involved very early with, with touch surgery and digital solutions. I've been involved with robotics since 1999. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to say I've been doing robotics for 22 years, but that's who I am. And um, I am delighted to be with this amazing panel and and talk about the future of digital surgery. That's that's where things are going, and 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 at UCSD we are we are very committed to this, and, and we have a great partnership relationship with Medtronics and and touch surgery. So we have to talk about the future. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hogan, and it's a pleasure to uh, and an honor to have you with us. And then over to Megan Rosengarten. Hi, George. Uh, thank you for the, the kind introduction. I was feeling like we were a trio of uh, superheroes as, as we talked about this. So, so honored to be here um, with this group. And uh, as you mentioned, I lead our surgical robotics operating unit um, here at Medrotic. And we're, we're focused primarily on what we refer to as soft tissue robotics um, and those robotic solutions. And then also um, AI solutions for laparoscopic and robotic assisted surgery. And have been uh, in, involved in one way or the other in robotics and, and AI for uh, well over the last decade um, or so in the healthcare space. And um, again, excited for the conversation today. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, and then over to uh, Professor Stoyanov. 
Thank you, George, and hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to, to join this uh, esteemed panel today. Um, as George said, I'm Chief Scientist at uh, Digital Surgery, uh, where um, it's been really exciting over the past few years to see the transition of some early R&D research uh, going to product, and even more exciting over the past year, uh, see how that can be scaled up, uh, being part of uh, the Medtronic family. Uh, I've been involved in uh, surgical robotics and most predominantly on the AI side of it, not quite as long as uh, Professor Horgan, but almost uh, since about 2001, so uh, 20 years or so now, uh, developing algorithms uh, to uh, process surgical video uh, and uh, over the last few years um, getting, getting into more hardware and, and so on. Uh, so it's been really, really exciting, um, and it is really exciting to be where we are today, where we can see some of uh, the work that started uh, all those years ago uh, become robust, scalable technology that can be used to enhance healthcare. So very, very excited to be uh, speaking with everyone and to join the discussion today. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, given all your roles, we know how busy you are. So um, really thank you again for, for joining us. Um, what promises to be over the next 50 minutes, a, a really great conversation. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll just give everyone who's joined us today a sense of the agenda. Um, so today we'll be discussing the future of surgery. Um, and we're gonna do this in a series of one-to-one uh, -one conversations um, with myself. Firstly, uh, Professor Stoyanov, then Dr. Horgan, and finally with Megan Rosengarten. And then um, hopefully uh, we'll leave time for some questions uh, and answers before um, we finish uh, the webinar with the aim to finish the webinar on the hour. So if we go to the next slide, I'll just set the scene um, briefly, I think, before um, we tee up the conversation um, with Dan Stoyanov. So I think most of us would agree that data, artificial intelligence, and automation provide the potential cornerstone for greater efficiency, uh, for more value, and offer opportunities to reduce healthcare variability, uh, and specifically for today, surgical variability. And as I said at the start, um, at Medtronic, we're taking full advantage of today's rapidly advancing technologies like data analytics, AI, and robotics, um, to try to unlock new experiences and opportunities for healthcare professionals, for healthcare systems, and ultimately for patients. Uh, and I'm lucky enough um, to work on some of these technologies day to day uh, and indeed work with some of the panelists um, today. Um, at Medtronic, we're seeing AI applications across our portfolio, which are meaningfully solving problems uh, for clinicians and for patients. Uh, including using AI algorithms for things like cardiac monitoring um, within the GI space to automatically identify colorectal polyps, through to assisting in diabetes management by deliver, uh, delivering proactive dosing um, advice and personalized advice to each individual. And I think we all agree that the future is increasingly digital, uh, and we are witnessing firsthand, I suppose, the power of AI in patient care. And these innovative technologies are a vital piece in our plan to move surgery forward. And we're really excited to hone in on today key areas such as digital surgery and surgery supported by AI. And it's really interesting, both Dan and um, uh, Dr. Horgan mentioned, that, you know, the past two decades of working with robotic surgery with AI. Um, it's really interesting in terms of how we might project forward the next two decades uh, and, and what innovations um, we may or may not see. Um, so I'm going to start the, the uh, conversation um, with um, Dan Stoyanov, Professor Stoyanov, um, and uh, we'll kick off um, with uh, just a, a, a quick question, Jan, uh, Dan, to, to see whether you can tell the audience and those who've joined us a bit more about your role at Digital Surgery. You mentioned your chief scientist. Sounds very exciting. Uh, are you able to, to bring to life what that means on a on a day to day um, basis? Thanks, George. I'm not sure I can do the, that title uh, justice, but I'll try to uh, explain uh, what what we do and what the uh, the team that I lead 
uh, does. So I joined digital surgery being really, really excited by uh, the ability to codify surgery and to understand surgical procedures uh, at the time through simulation and through breaking down surgical process. Um, and with the idea that we can build AI technology in order to extract this type of codification automatically from uh, video. And so we built uh, an AI uh, team and uh, AI uh, algorithmic technology. Um, and in order to deploy that practically, uh, we needed to solve the, the challenge of uh, building hardware in order to capture that video. Um, and so we built another team to build hardware. Um, and uh, we also uh, have a team looking at uh, different, uh, uh, different visualization strategies. So if you're able to extract this information, would you be able to enhance the type of visualization that you can deliver uh, in the OR? Um, so that's been uh, my, my role. Uh, and it's really exciting to see some of these uh, early ideas uh, now transition into uh, products. Thanks, Dan. And, and what do you see as some of the biggest benefits of the technology that your team's been um, working on? Um, so I can tell you that 20 years ago, uh, because we mentioned this 20 years, 20 years ago, I think if you wanted to get video out of the OR, uh, you may have had to carry a VHS recorder into the OR or uh, a few years later, mini DV recorders. Um, and then working with that video uh, involved um, digitizing it, and then it was very, very difficult to extract any meaningful, meaningful information uh, from it. It was even difficult to get it into your PowerPoint presentations uh, at the time. I think where we are today is that all of this process has been made uh, very easy, almost automatic. Uh, the user interfaces are fantastic. The security, the privacy, cybersecurity of the devices is appropriate for what's needed in the OR. The scalability of the technology is, uh, is also uh, appropriate. So you don't need to carry hard disks or manage everything in a piecemeal fashion. Um, the data can be uh, sorted. It can be stored in a harmonized way. It can be shared appropriately, uh, again, secure, securely. Um, and really, it's that uh, platform and that ease of use that is allowing the technology to scale and potentially to open up some of the possibilities that might be uh, delivered through AI built upon this platform technology. Thanks, Dan. And you mentioned uh, some of those new opportunities. It'd be good to spend a few minutes uh, just discussing some of the, um, the problems in, in surgery you think are your team's focusing on uh, and, and the, the problems that your team's going to solve with some of the new features, uh, some of the R&D work that you're uh, undertaking and your team's undertaking. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll obviously leave the clinical problems of surgery to Professor Horgan, who, who knows them much better than I ever will. Um, but I think that uh, some of the capability that we're building is really uh, based around the idea that we can turn uh, surgery into a more quantitatively understood discipline. So we can start extracting quantitative metrics, quantitative information from what occurred during a particular surgical process. And I think that can help us uh, to build the tools that can drive standardization or a true understanding of what is best practice or how you can improve your practice. And then if we project this 10, 20 years into the future, maybe some of those features are going to allow us to link process to an optimal patient outcome and start driving better outcomes for people undergoing uh, interventional treatment. So I think that building that quantitative capability uh, in surgery is really, really uh, important. And of course, once it exists, some of those potential features or some of those uh, algorithms that can extract the information can also be used in order to drive better process during the intervention itself. So not just to analyze and to understand it, but potentially to assist the clinical team to make more optimal decisions, uh, to avoid uh, risk, uh, to, to enhance process. 
And I think that's really, really uh, exciting because that will have a very direct impact on, on patient outcomes and can really improve um, the, the way that surgery is conducted. Thanks, Dan. And, and from what you described there, I suppose AI and, and the opportunity for artificial intelligence is important in terms of bringing about scale. But, and I know this is a broad question, um, how would you describe uh, the artificial intelligence in, available in healthcare and surgery today? And um, what do you expect uh, for the future? Maybe not the next 20 years, but um, you know, over the next five, 10 years in, in terms of how AI may start impacting um, surgery and healthcare? So I think, I think generally uh, AI in healthcare is, is exciting and it's growing, uh, but I would say it's still fairly nascent. In surgery, it is particularly so. And I think that's because surgery uh, obviously requires a lot of safety. It requires regulation. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, diligence. And so uh, transforming a uh, surgery or uh, delivering new technology for surgery is a process that takes uh, time. So if they, I think we're in a very exciting time, but we're in the early days of uh, AI and what it may offer uh, for uh, enhanced surgical uh, capabilities. Um, I think over the next five years, we're going to see a lot of that capability transition into scalable, robust solutions. From, so move from a demonstrator uh, that something may be possible into something actually being uh, usable and robust enough to assist uh, the surgeon or the clinical team to perform a certain uh, function. So I think uh, if you look at uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, you would have seen the capability or the idea of autonomous vehicles or of autonomous robots uh, many, many decades ago. Uh, but it's only really more recently that this capability is becoming something of a reality uh, where these vehicles may be actually rolled out and used uh, by society. And I think over the next five, maybe 10 years, uh, we will see solutions like this emerge for uh, specialist subtasks of surgery. I don't think you will see autonomous surgery in the next, in the next uh, three, four or five years, uh, but I think certain aspects will be able to be um, uh, delivered better through AI capabilities. What do you think is required to, to make that future a reality? I'm kind of thinking of, you know, there's, there's potential um, challenges to introducing new technology in, into healthcare um, uh, and not just challenges in terms of, of developing it, which is, which is what some of your team do. So what do you think is required to, to make that future a reality, the future that you just described? So I think there, there are still technical challenges that need to be solved. Uh, they, uh, they obviously cannot be underestimated, but I think beyond those, the collaboration with uh, top surgeons, with clinical teams uh, is key. It's crucial in order to really make sure that uh, that technology is deployed in a really, really usable way. I think it's also key to engage with training and with understanding the impact and the human factors uh, that this technology may influence and how it can be really delivered in, a, in products that are that are helping the process uh, rather than just adding new new tech in the in the OR. So I think that engagement and that collaboration is really pivotal. Perfect, and thank you for kicking us off. And um, uh, hopefully, when we get to the Q and A, um, uh, we'll be able to hear more about your kind of viewpoints and, and opinions. But thank you, Dan, for kicking off this uh, uh, first part of the discussion. And I think um, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, of the audience before we move uh, to the next section where we're going to be um, discussing uh, the viewpoints and, and, and opinions from Dr. Horgan. So I think, Richard, we're ready to run the uh, quick poll. Uh, and this poll is um, picking up the theme that we've had over the first and second uh, webinars that we run, ran in terms of surgical video really being fundamental to uh, some of the innovation. Uh, we're just asking uh, those on the line uh, how often you might record your surgical video, whether you are a trainee or a very experienced surgeon. And we'll just give you a few seconds to answer that poll. Perfect, the poll's ended. And we can see there 
uh, uh, results um, in terms of uh, a fairly even uh, mix uh, diversity of, of those on the line. Um, uh, 12% always recording, 12% uh, usually recording, and, and the, the um, uh, largest portion, uh, just over a third, saying they sometimes record video. Thank you very much for responding to that poll. Um, and we're going to now move uh, to uh, um, Dr. Horgan to say, uh, Chair of uh, Chief of Surgery, uh, um, and someone uh, who has for many years um, been really interested in, in the technology, techno technological development of surgery. We're delighted to be joined um, today by uh, Dr. Horgan. Dr. Horgan, are you on the line and with us? I am. Perfect. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and per that poll that we just ran, we focused on surgical video in the first few um, webinars we ran with various surgeons feeding back on the really foundational ways uh, video can support their teams, residents and themselves. So firstly, just to kick off this conversation, I'm, I'm interested in the ways uh, you and your department use surgical video uh, in your practice. Yes, thank you, George. And, and that, that was a great intro from Dan, you know, when he mentioned that it takes a monumental amount of work to record the video in the operating room. and, and for a guy that has been in academics for 27 years, uh, I went through all those processes. And, and what we found out since we partnered with Top Surgery early in the game, more than two or three years ago, is, is seamless, right? So we don't rely on anybody. And, 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 and it's, it used to be a, an act of God to have a video finished by the end of the day. And in a day of 7 a surgery, to have the, all of them uploaded on the website and, and on the cloud uh, in a seamless way uh, where, where the faces are not seen, the system shows blanks if it's out of the belly, etc. Uh, it has changed the way we, we import data and we manage data post-op. So um, for us, it's very useful. We have always recorded that. In the past, I needed a special nurse, a two fellows, and a tech to do that. Now I, I need nothing. So clearly, it has impacted what, what we do. And, and the question is how we manage that data, which is the future, right? Uh, I see that Dan said it very clearly, very, very, very well, where he says that right now, the way we are using digital technology in the operating room is meaningless. And, and, and this is the first real step to move forward. Thanks. And, and how do you think technologies such as Touch Surgery Enterprise, which you mentioned, uh, will or, or may impact surgical practice and patient care? What, what improvements do you think they can, they can um, make in, in a department and also to individual surgeons as they, they practice? Well, there, there are many ways, right? So, so <clears throat> way number one, um, a surgeon leaves fellowship or residency and then uh, is out alone in the world operating without uh, any feedback from anybody. Uh, and that doesn't happen in, a, in any other specialty I know. I mean, sport people, pilots, etc. They, 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 they get continued active feedback on what they have done. You know, if you look at the plane industry, uh, they will look at the plane pathway and, and see if the pilot did the right thing during the critical moments of the storm, etc. We cannot do that. If we don't record the video, then we don't know what happened with the bleeding, if, if the surgeon was able to react the right way and how we can improve that surgeon. So that one is an easy one, right? The, the second one is how do we create best practices? How do we standardize operations with data? Not with Dr. Horgan saying that my operation is the very best one, but with data, proving with outcomes and movements in the operation that that movement and that step of the operation impacts the outcome of the patient. That is going to make this better. Um, we know from data that if you make a right turn in a freeway at 120 miles an hour, you are most likely to crash. And that way, today cars don't even let you do that. They will stop for you. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that that one is, is a second one that, that it will be easily achieved when we combine data, videos, and machine learning or AI can help us understand that data and tell us 
this is where we should be doing the operation. This is, this is a best possible operation, which will be pieces of every surgeon. And, and the, the other one that is also easy, when you look at what um, Dan said earlier about autonomous staplers, right? That's, that's an easy one. I don't want a, a, a stapler with five different colors. Uh, if you if you put in a in a room twenty surgeons and there are hundred and twelve in this talk today, and we ask how do you do a sleep gastrectomy, there are going to be one hundred and ten combinations of staplers. Well, how, how do we unify this? How how do we make the stapler decide what color and not the surgeon based on the mood that morning? Um, and I know this is very big, but it is a reality. Every time that we do meetings and we pull surgeons, the colors are all over the place and the outcomes are pretty similar. And this is where machine learning is going to impact patient care. I don't know if I'm clear on that, but I think that this is the future. Yeah, and, th and thank you. And, and some really interesting examples. And it, it's really interesting to hear uh, you mentioned some parallels with uh, aviation and pilot training, and then also some of the technology in driverless cars. It's it's always struck me that there's so much healthcare could learn from uh, and embrace from from other sectors. Um, so you mentioned the you know some of the the future of surgery, and you mentioned you worked uh, um, robotics uh, since the the late 1990s. So more broadly, I guess what excites you about the future of artificial intelligence and surgery and the new technologies in in surgery? I, I suppose. Your training now and coaching surgeons who will be still practicing surgery the midpoint of this century uh, in 2050. So, so what's most exciting to you about some of the the potential development of technology? That that the, we want to be able to follow those, those surgeons, right? And 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 without having a, a a human eye criticizing, having the machine giving them data. Um, the, the surgeons have big egos, right? And, and, and sometimes they don't want to bring data up so they don't get hurt or, or, or we don't like to hear no or what you're doing is wrong. But if we have a computer telling us, hey, you can improve here and there, um, that, that will be huge. And, 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 and I think that, that, that we're getting close to that, you know? A, a, an example is how do we bring experience to young surgeons? Right, I am very likely not better technically from what I was 20 years ago, but I'm better from the brain point of view. I can analyze and, and manage stress much better. And, and I can look at all the decisions I made before and look at the situation and, and change based on my experience. What I would like to see and that we will see is that that surgeon that is five years out of residency or fellowship will get the same experience through machine learning and through the computers. That will tell them in this critical moment, the last 25,000 searches I analyzed, this is what they did. And that will bring, because that, that's what planes do, right? Planes analyze data and, and bring it to the pilot. And, and that's, that's, that's not difficult. That, that's, that I think that is, is tangible, but by uploading tons of videos to, to, the, to the cloud, um, which are scripted. I mean, they clearly they, they are same cure. We can look at data from different aspects and, and bring experience back to surgeons. Because, you know, believe it or not, patients like older surgeons. Patients like to see some great hair because they believe that's correlated with experience. Well, that's not true all the time, but, but there is some truth there. I want to bring that experience to the young surgeons. So we don't talk, I mean, I never ask a pilot. How many flights have you taken? Because I know that that pilot has have gone through simulations, hours of training, and have equal hours than the young pilot, than the older pilot. Patients are asking surgeons all the time, how many surgeries you have done? Well, we need to take that away because surgery should not be only about how many you perform, but the experience that the machines and, and, the, and the context can bring you. Another easy area where, where this is gonna change the game and and this is what really excited me the most when I visited that search in London many, many years ago is, can machine learning or AI help the flow of the operation? We are relying on your scrub nurse, your scrub tech and your nurse. I am lucky to be old enough to have always the same nurse, but my faculty is not that lucky. 
And they say, you live in, in, in your own bubble because when I go to the other room with nurse X, he or she doesn't know what, what my next step is. The operation becomes a nightmare. Machine learning, touch surgery has the capability of predicting the next step of the operation for that surgeon and giving on a different monitor to the nurse the message that the next step will be the staplers and the following step will be the suction irrigation. That will improve the flow of the operation and improve patient safety. Well, that's so interesting. And um, particularly in terms of your, your viewpoints of, of some of the new technologies being able to transform training and coaching of surgeons all the way through to being able to support surgeons and indeed the surgical teams uh, whilst they operate. Um, and as you say, uh, to the benefit of patients. Dr. Horgan, thank you so much for um, uh, that discussion. And as I say, we'll come back to um, the Q&A in a few minutes. Um, but before we do that, um, we're going to um, talk to Megan Rosengarten, uh, president of uh, surgical robotics within Medtronic. And I think you have avoided the hurricane just about on the East Coast today, Megan. Yes, yes. Thankfully, where, where we are on the East Coast, uh, unfortunately, others not not as lucky, but we are uh, here with internet and electricity and water. So I'm uh, thankful for that. Um, yeah, and we, we are thinking of all of those uh, impacted um, today. Um, but thankfully, uh, you've managed to avoid the, the worst of it. So, Megan, um, it'd be good to, to kick off this uh, quick discussion just uh, for you to tell us a little bit about the recent robotic assisted surgery uh, news and also the role Touch Surgery Enterprise has, has played in that. I know there's been some really exciting news recently, so it'd be great to, to get um, some uh, oversight for, you know, overview from, from you on that. Yeah, and I, I will uh, apologize in advance. I could talk about this forever, so I'm gonna um, try to shorten it um, down. So uh, as, uh, as you know, George and, and Dan have been a part of this and, and many have seen, we have had some pretty exciting milestones over, over the summer um, and kind of starting with late last, uh, last spring where we've had now our first patient procedures in the world using the Hugo Robotic Assisted Surgery System. Um, and, and one, there are many reasons that's exciting. One, that's a you know, culmination of the, almost a decade of work of, uh, of bringing that to market. Um, oh, and I was getting a note that it's a little tough to hear me. Can you all hear me? Okay. I now. can hear you okay, Megan. You can hear me? Okay, good. Just let me know if not, and I'll, I'll try to switch. Um, but I, as I was saying, we've had our first in the world patient procedures with, uh, with the Hugo system this summer. Um, one of the reasons that's really exciting is that has been in parts of the world, namely Latin America, most of those procedures um, in countries that have not yet had robotic assisted surgery in some cases. So going back to our, our belief in some of the things that you stated early on, um, George, you know, we really are about how do we expand access to quality healthcare to more people around the world and that quality healthcare uh, in large part meaning minimally invasive options for us. So to see that come to fruition um, is, is really rewarding and exciting. Uh, and we've seen those procedures in both urology and gynecology now over the summer. Um, and then that uh, kind of second really exciting piece is the role that touch surgery, as you mentioned, have, have played in that. So these first procedures um, have been, uh, we like to call it powered by uh, touch surgery enterprise. And the feedback that we've gotten from surgeons so far, very similar to what we've heard from Dr. Horgan, has been really amazing of the ability to go back and take a look at those initial cases and be able to real time pair video with clinical and surgical tasks with results and take a look at that kind of full spectrum of data has been powerful. Um, and, and one of the questions we've gotten, which is a question that we, we love to hear is, hey, can I use this in laparoscopic surgery? Can I use this in other robotic assisted surgery? And, and the answer is yes. And based on the you know, amazing work of Dan and his team and other members of having the foresight to create a solution that is modality, meaning laparoscopic or robotic assisted um, agnostic, a modality that is agnostic with the solution of touch surgery, as well as agnostic to manufacturers, meaning you can use almost any visualization system or in any image or video producing device with touch surgery enterprise um, has created this really cool thing that I think we maybe even missed how cool it was gonna be that these early adopters of robotics can say, well, now I can use touch surgery to record my laparoscopic surgery 
and my robotic assistant, particularly when I'm new to that robotic game, and compare side by side and see what steps am I doing differently. Um, and the time it takes for each step uh, and stage has been really powerful as a part of that learning curve for those who are new to robotics overall. It also goes to something that the, the full Hugo system and solution we're, we're really focused on, which is how do we make as many of the components in Hugo as universal as possible? So you can use the tower for laparoscopic surgery, you can use the tower for robotics, and that means touch surgery enterprise as a part of that, the visualization system, uh, the energy generator, all of these kind of pieces coming together. So how do we make a tool that yes is bold and has bold innovation, but is not disrupting the needs and the workflow of our surgeons and our hospitals. And that, that's really coming to fruition in, in large part um, due to touch surgery, which is uh, amazing. Thanks Megan. And, and um, Dr. Horgan obviously um, uh, gave some really great examples of, of the potential future of surgery and, and technology. What role do you see Medtronic playing in, in some of that um, future over the next few years? Yeah, well, I, and I want to hit on something um, that Dan mentioned that I, I really liked. I actually jotted it down, um, Dan, so I may quote you elsewhere for this too. But this idea of the value of data analytics and AI today and that value in the future. And I completely agree with uh, the picture that Dan and Dr. Horgan were, were um, kind of visualizing that if you go back a decade or two decades, there was promise. There was a lot of promise and a lot of belief in that promise of the role that data and analytics and therefore artificial intelligence could play within healthcare. But it was really belief and hope. And you kind of had to hold on to that. And you kind of look at where we are as a moment in time now, it's that demonstrable um, that Dan mentioned, you're starting to see it. It is not necessarily just future and kind of far looking out. Um, I would also say we're not quite at the future is now, right? There's still a lot of steps to sort of getting to that. But the, the part of what has been so nice about the touch surgery solutions is it's been designed with both the today, meaning what are those meaningful problems, complex and simple, that we can solve right now so we add value based on what we're hearing is the need from surgeons and hospital administrators with also that eye to, its, to the future, it's gonna be something that's going to help us continue to advance to things that I think are, are quite spectacular. And to your question about sort of future that Medtronic plays, we're looking at how do we do some of those things that look like anatomical structure identification um, and navigation using image processing of landmarks in the body to help with that. Um, all of that sort of adding up to some of the, the picture of standardization that Dr. Horgan um, painted, um, as well as I, I had to smile as we're talking about stapling reloads, like wouldn't it be nice to not have to decide between black and purple and et cetera, you know, when, when you're in that surgery. And that part of the role of a touch surgery enterprise solution today that's helping with surgical video management is also helping us collectively, surgeons, hospitals, vendors and manufacturers and partners develop technologies that will get to that goal of, yes, we can actually assist with clinical decision-making real time, take some of the burden off of the less, less valuable tasks that are on the mind of a clinician um, by assisting or automating some of that while letting the focus really be on the patient and, and the complex and tough tasks that are at hand. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, and um, thank you so much to Dr. Horgan, Professor Stoynov and, and, and Megan um, for those conversations. And we're hopefully now uh, gonna open it up to some Q&A, um, uh, which I think should be um, really great. So I'm gonna hand over to uh, Rich just to take us through and take the audience through the uh, practicalities of the Q&A. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, once again, the Q&A tab should be located at the bottom of your screen where all of your meeting controls are. Uh, you should see that and then the tab should come up. And once you do, you can type out your question. And if you so choose, you can submit it anonymously. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. And um, we've got a first question for Dr. Horgan. 
uh, come in. So I'll, I'll try and read this without fluffing the lines. So Dr. Horgan, you spoke about how digital surgery technology uh, like touch surgery enterprise can help accelerating the learning curve for upcoming surgeons. What impact can that have on your hospital and, and what does it mean for patients around the world um, if that uh, technology can scale? I mean, it has a huge impact, right? If, if we can bring a, a management data to the, to, to the surgeon alive, live when they are doing the operations and, and, and give me advice on go right or left, that's, that's critical. Um, I think that when I see my, my, my younger faculty or my fellows operating, technically they are good, but when they encounter a challenge, they look back at me and say, right or left. And, 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 and that will happen in, in, in the real life when, when they go out to practice. And I wanna be able to bring experience back to surgeons. And, and, and I think that that's the impact of digital solutions. Like exactly like Megan was saying earlier, you know, it, it, can you compare your laparoscopic technique that you do so well with the robotic technique? And what do you do different that, that was impacted by using a new technology that should have not been impacted by that? Or yes. And, and we are not used to that feedback. You know, George, I, I, I'm going to talk about my, my life as a golfer, right? I learned to play golf as a kid. I was a very good golfer, single digit handicap as a 15 year old kid. I never got any visual feedback. I changed my game five years ago because I was getting old. Uh, and now I am a five handicap because I was getting optical feedback constantly. They were recording me. They were telling me, this is what you're doing right, this is what you're doing wrong. We don't have that in the operating room. So how do we make surgeons better without impacting their ego? Digital solutions, that's surgery. A machine telling you, hey, and that's when it impact patient care. It's showing you that your movement was not the right one and, and it can be improved a little bit. Uh, so I, I am very excited about the future. For the first time I see that uh, we can impact more, more patients by training better surgeons. Because as a surgeon, as a mentor, I can train maybe one or two a year. Through digital solutions, we can proctor thousands and continue proctoring through their career. And, and that is exciting. That's fantastic. I don't know whether um, Dan or, or Megan want to add anything to that. I could see a few nods, so you may be in full agreement. Yeah, I, I'm definitely in full agreement. The, the one thing of um, my head nods, uh, Dr. Horgan, on your comments were, were that it's echoing things we're hearing elsewhere, which is almost this move from surgery and surgeons as artistry and artists to high performing athletes. And I think as, as a industry and as a group, we've um, maybe ignored that for too long and thought that there would actually be pushback of getting more visual data um, for, from surgeons and wanting to kind of stay in that realm of uh, artists and therefore variability as opposed to now we're seeing this pull for, no, I'm, I'm an athlete that I want to continue to get better and better for myself and for my patients. So I, I just think that's something that's really interesting and only coming about in the last five to 10 years. Um, and just to, to that point, this, this is the time. Um, and I think we're all kind of sitting back and saying, wow, um, it, it's a little ridiculous that we haven't been recording surgery, that we haven't been incorporating this. And so solving that problem of, well, why not? Um, and it really is it's been hard, it's cumbersome, it's clumsy. Uh, the technology hasn't suited that. So I, I think that's one of the things I'm most excited whenever you have an elegant solution that's meeting a real need whose time has come and it'll make a difference. Wow, that, that's a really cool spot uh, to be in. So. Thanks Megan, and, a, and a, a question came in on that and it may be worth um, unpacking it a bit. So uh, the question is, according to the poll earlier, there are surgeons that are maybe disinterested in recording or uploading surgical video. Um, how do you view this and, and what are the ways to maybe change attitudes towards recording video? That's quite a big question, but I think a, an important one. So I'll open up, Dr. Horgan, you came off mute and then maybe to, to Dan and Megan. Yes, um, so, you know, attorneys have a scare surgeons, right? 
And, and every time we think about re recording a video, we are thinking about, okay, that attorney is gonna come in and get my video and criticize me. But this is quality improvement. So, so those videos are totally, uh, first they, they're de-identified and two quality improvement that they have no access. And, and, and those things, we need to teach surgeons that having a black box in the world is not a real black box to, to spy at them, but it's to improve them as surgeons, to improve the system and to improve patient safety. And it will take a cultural change to do that, okay? Because um, it, it, it took us a long time to understand that this is needed and we do it and no one complains about it and we are happy about it. Uh, but we all understand that we are trying to improve us as physicians, us as a team in the operating room and to improve at the end of the day, patient outcomes and increase patient safety. And when you look at it from that point of view, then, then you are not that, scare because that's the world um i like to see how i perform i i, I like to see what i did better and and it, it is going to take a culture change and, and and these solutions that are seamless that that as it was presented earlier by dan is de-identified is secure is in the cloud i mean you cannot go and find and say okay this is your operation it's not going to happen it's, it's in the cloud but you can get a lot of benefits. Um, Megan was very good at saying, you know, this is art, but that surgery should not be art. It, it, it should be more broad, you know, when we learn that we, we, when, when we standardize a technique like we're doing with lip gastrectomy, patient's outcomes are better. So it, 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 it needs to happen, it's time. I think I think I completely completely agree with uh, what Dr. Horgan Horgan said, and um, I think touch surgery enterprise is potentially the the beginning of providing something that's useful in order to drive that culture change. So I think the more useful that we can make such platforms and such technology, uh, the more features that benefit uh, the surgical team, uh, the more enthusiasm there will be to participate and to to upload and to record and the more adoption that uh, that there will be and of course it becomes a an ecosystem so the more adoption there is the more insight we'll be able to provide back brilliant thank you uh, Dan. thank you dr horgan um there's a question here uh, coming from megan um may well have been spurred by the conversation about uh, staplers um, which is, tell us about the role of the instrumentation uh, on the Hugo robotic uh, system. Yeah, happy, happy to do that. That wasn't a, a plant, but glad to get the, the question there. Um, so, you know, a few things. The, the role of instrumentation on Hugo is, um, is massive. Right? And if, if uh, we wouldn't be here with Hugo if we hadn't started um, as a, a leader in laparoscopic surgery, and if we didn't have a many, many, many decades long, that 60, uh, 60 year um, focus on how do we advance minimally invasive surgery. And that's sort of, you know, what Medtronic at its core has been about um, for, for quite a long time of how do we continually help support the move from open surgery to traditional laparoscopic surgery and now to robotic assisted. And we bring with that, that core um, know-how and expertise that's born not only from our own um, internal teams and our engineering teams, but also from surgeons who we've partnered with over, over the years um, to develop that and say, okay, now what does best in class instrumentation look like for robotic assisted surgery? And then going back to that point of wherever possible, it's the same technology on, on purpose. Um, you know, either the same um, IP and know-how in order to make devices like ligature and tri staple um, now applicable for robotic assisted surgery um, and spots where it's literally the same, literally the same stapling reloads that you can take off the shelf for a laparoscopic case, you can take off the shelf for a robotic case. And that kind of gets back, and I'm, I'm going to loop this back into to touch surgery of this idea of, um, you know, we want to have these bold innovations that solve meaningful problems, and we want them to be easy to adopt. And I think sometimes as an industry, we forget that part of ease of adoption and how do you kind of make this something that's um, all the way to enjoyable to use, but at a minimum, not a hassle and not a headache. And that's again, a part of where touch surgery 
comes in so much about everything we've talked about and going back to that pool. Um, even for folks who don't currently often or at all record video, you know, I'm very curious and we talked to people who tried and then gave it up and the why, and it wasn't a belief that it wasn't important. It was, it was a pain. It was a pain to do that. It's just kind of solving for that. And we put that into our instrumentation and philosophy as well as what not cause unnecessary um, compromise in instrumentation of using the technology that you already believe in and trust in laparoscopic surgery um, is really critical. And then the last piece I'd say is sort of role of instrumentation um, as it relates to both Hugo and uh, touch surgery is all of the work that Dan and his team has done to use image processing and AI to automatically identify the tools that are used in surgery. So getting to this point of in the future that across surgical procedures, not only can you have automatic annotation and detection of surgical steps, but you also can have automatic detection of the tool that was used in that step. And then later be able to compare the usage of those tools across different manufacturers, different modalities, and see did that matter for an outcome and was that variability warranted. I think all of that comes together makes for this super awesome you know, sort of triangle of AI instrumentation and a robotic platform um, that's um, re really exciting. Thanks so much, uh, Megan. Uh, we're coming close on time. There's one question that's come in that I can answer, which is, will the video recordings automatically deliver the full surgical procedure to my phone and are they de-identified? Yes, uh, I don't need to put that to the panel, um, but the the I think we've got time for one more. Uh, and this, is, uh, this has uh, come in which is um, there was a comparison to driverless cars. Um, where are we in surgery compared to the automobile industry? Parking sensors, power steering, GPS, question mark. So uh, maybe close us out in, on, on that comparison. I'll maybe pose it to Dan first, and then maybe uh, Megan and, and Dr. Horgan may have views, but uh, Dan, comparison to, to surgery and the automobile industry. I think we're... I mean, it's a really, really tough comparison to make. Um, and um, I think we don't have as much automation. So I think maybe uh, a robot is the same as power steering on the car. So it's a better instrument than manual straight stick instruments, right? But obviously much more advanced because a surgical robot has probably the same complexity as a car, you know, with many, many thousands of, of components. I think in terms of, uh, in terms of AI, um, you know, we're, we're in a much more nascent space than the car industry is. And if you look at the scale and uh, the, the amount of data that companies uh, like Tesla, just to name, to name one, have been collecting and, 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 and uh, for the number of years that they've been doing it for, um, I think in surgery, we've got a lot of work to do uh, in order to scale things. Uh, but we're at the place where it's possible uh, so by having platform technology like uh, the surgery enterprise, it's becoming possible. And I think that's really, really exciting because we now can tackle these problems. Whereas previously, we were constantly stumbling because we weren't even getting off the, off the roadblock, if you like, um, because just the, the scale of it wasn't possible. I want to, to echo, if I can, what, what Dan just said, you know, um, but, but I have seen <clears throat> machine learning identifying the parts of the operation without us giving any input. So the, the software is getting there <clears throat> to understanding the steps of the operation. I think that we didn't have any support before. There was no money going into exploring these digital solutions. Now there is. And I think that uh, companies have really focused on really um, bringing digital solutions to the operating room. And, and, and that's going to impact everything. Uh, Tesla has been able to doing it for many, many years. We are just starting, but um, I have seen a lot of progress. Uh, we have seen Sages being very involved and taking a leadership as a society. That did not happen before. And I think that is, this is a good time to be in, in the digital world in medicine. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Yeah, George, I, I would add one, like a um, just answer to the question, such a fun question too. Um, I think that we're at powered windows and almost automatic transmission. So I think, um, and as I think it's very early, 
But think about both those things were pretty powerful, powered windows and automatic transmission, right? So I think that they're, again, solving real problems. It's back to uh, Dan's demonstrable, you know, value and things in place now, but very, very early, um, you know, with that, and then the, the sort of funness of that theoretical question, I can tell you, we ask ourselves that literal question all the time. And we phrase it as what can we learn from the automotive industry and how they are pursuing autonomous driving that is applicable from a technology standpoint and also, um, honestly, a regulatory standpoint. And, and by that, I mean, I think that our technology and our capabilities and technology are going to surpass um, our readiness as a, a, a culture and an organization and kind of a community to adopt some of these technologies. So continuing to work on what are what's the evidence that we need to see to make sure and need to provide to make sure that these are accurate and safe is very similar to what you see in a regulated industry like uh, automotive. Um, and the other piece that we look to automotive industry and a lot of our, our partners, external partners, um, serve those, that industry as well, of what are the types of technologies like edge computing, like 5G, like all the things that we talk about that are going to enable doing things um, faster and that are really, really required in surgery so you can have real time computing power that are gonna be required before you get into something that looks like um, autonomy of different tasks. And, and I believe that Dr. Horgan mentioned this um, earlier today. I, I very much think that's going to be automation of non-critical tasks, more workflow and things like that that don't add value for a highly trained clinician to do or suffer from variability of different users. So that different, you know, changing out of the OR staff, how do you kind of solve it? I think that's where we'll start to see automation before, long before we get into something that looks like surgery and surgical tasks being automated. Thank you so much, uh, Megan, for that, and Dr. Horgan and, and Dan Stoyanov. So uh, we've come uh, to time. Um, thank you so much to everyone around the world who's dialed in to watch this uh, live. And thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Megan Rosengarten, uh, Dr. Horgan, and Professor Dan Stoyanov, um, who've tuned in uh, and been part of this third and final edition of our Touch Surgery Enterprise webinar series. Um, I'm told here to say, please do follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter and head over to the Medtronic Surgical Robotics Digital Surgery page to learn more about our digital surgery solutions. Um, so I wish everyone a good rest of the day. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who's dialed in and take care.